they've got the knowledge, they've learned a lot, you know, and they're willing to give you advice for free. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. And you just got to be open to people. It's all about people. You know, if you're, you know, entrepreneurship is selling. So that's you as a person is selling. So you got to be good at it. So, you know, just be yourself and, and don't be scared of no. If somebody's no, one out of 10 is no, so it's fine. You know, just carry on. You're going to get a lot of no's in business. One, two, three, four. Welcome to the Boom Studio, a show where we unpack business ideas, share entrepreneurial journeys, and interview some of the brightest innovators in South Africa. In today's episode, Alistair and myself interview Lloyd Peltier. Lloyd is an entrepreneur, family man, musician, and a lifelong learner who built a string of businesses from a humble beginning. We'll learn more about how Lloyd got started on his entrepreneurial journey and how he leveraged the power of audiobooks and his love for people to become a powerhouse businessman. Let's get into the episode. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, uh, Travis. So we've got uh, Mr. Lloyd Peltier joining us today. Welcome, Lloyd. Thanks. Nice to be here. Awesome. So, uh, Lloyd, um, I know Lloyd, and uh, he has a fascinating story and uh, really a uh, incredible journey over some years and some uh, geographic uh, locations. Um, so uh, I thought it'd be cool to just uh, get Lloyd in and have a chat to him. Um, I think some some great experience uh, listeners could draw draw from in terms of uh, getting into business, building business, uh, and and the mindset and everything that he's learned and learning. Um, we've worked together and worked together on a few different businesses and projects, and uh, I must say it's exciting. And Lloyd's mindset is definitely refreshing and uh, there's a lot of energy around what he's doing and what's happening so uh, Lloyd maybe you can just uh, give us a little bit of background um, uh, in terms of you know where you're from um, and how you how you kind of what sort of formed um, you into the person you are today uh, you know you, you you've you've had you spent time in the states you've spent time in South Africa and a little bit of your journey, just as a bit of an intro, that we can just uh, get a feel. And uh, Travis, be uh, you know, jump in with anything you want to ask or add. Uh, so Lloyd, if you want, don't mind just giving us a little bit of a intro as to who you are and and where you're from, and uh, sort of what what you think uh, has contributed to to where you are today. Cool. Hello, Travis, Alistair, and all the listeners. Um, great to be here. Um, yeah, so funny enough, uh, I was born in South Africa, um, and six weeks old, I got exported to the USA. My dad's American, my mom's South African, so I grew up there until I was about 16, 17 years old, and then I moved back to South Africa, um, where I was a musician for many, many years, playing about 300 gigs a year for about eight years, um, and I just knew I wanted to do something, do something outside of music, you know, um, because... The only way you make money in music is if you play a gig. Um, you don't really make too much outside that unless you're really a international or a real big star, which very few are. So that's when I started my first um, audio book. I wanted to get into business and learn how to make money, uh, you know, add, add value um, and, you know, without having to actually be physically doing the physical work all the time like I was with music. You know, being on stage, having to do the gig, you got paid for each and every gig. So I just wanted to explore different avenues. And yeah, started my first book um, on audio books, business book, and then the rest is history. Grown a lot of things since then. Um, and it's been an exciting journey. Uh, what, what sort of age was that when you, you sort of decided uh, to do that? It was, it was about, it was about, I'd say, about 12 years ago, 2010, I started going, okay, you know, how many, how many gigs can you keep on playing and how sustainable is it? You know, you want to start a family and you want to, you know, 
you know, not be out on the road all the time. So I'd say about 2010, um, I downloaded my first audio book. I was just like, there's got to be something more out there. And, and how do you learn about business? Um, you know, what's the right steps? Because, you know, the schooling system doesn't teach you very much about money and, um, and things like that. So I had to go outside and go, okay, how do these successful entrepreneurs make money and become successful? And it's not necessarily just about the money. Um, you know, it's about the project, you know, around it and, you know, the money comes in and, you know, um, you know, money, money is freedom. So it's, it's, I didn't create the system. That is the system. So that's, that's where yeah, we are today. Yeah. But interesting. I mean, 300 gigs a year. That's phenomenal, right? I mean, that's that that in a way sounds somewhat like some you know success in some way in terms of being. I mean, having that many gigs a year, and yet you were wanting to sort of break out of that. Um, was it was it also sort of long term thinking? Uh, you know, like where you want to be uh, in a few years from 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 where you were. What what was really? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, you know, you're in your twenties, you're playing gigs, you're getting, a, you know, you have some hits on radio, um, you know, you're playing these venues, you're signing autographs, um, you know, it's it's a heck of a lot of fun in your twenties, you know, um, yeah. you know. Then I then I got to, got a little bit old, and I was thinking, you know, there's got to be more to just playing gigs and answering the same questions at gigs, you know, um, not taking, you know, anything away from gigging yeah. and stuff like that. It taught me, it taught me a lot. I mean, I managed the band, I got the gigs, I managed payments. So it, you know, that taught me a lot. It also taught you so it's a, a lot, lot of social skills. skills, interacting with people. Yeah. Yeah. It's it definitely yeah. taught me a lot. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, learned. It's an interesting aspect. Um, I've done, I've been involved in, in, in different industries and also the training of different uh, people. It's a very interesting thing, reg almost regardless of what you're doing initially, if you can develop some of those skills you just named now, and especially people skills. Uh, if you take a, a job like waitering, for example, um, anything where you are interacting with people, they have an expectation. It's, it's a really incredibly intense environment to learn uh, people skills, how to handle people, how to, you know, and how to keep people's attention, how to connect with people. So I think, you know, whether you were hugely conscious of it or not, it, it probably set uh, a lot of the foundation going forward in terms of not only like the skills, but also like what to avoid as well um, or what you don't want to be doing in the future. Um, yeah, I think, so I think, that's... you know, you can, you comparing it to waitering, um, a lot of big artists started out as waiters, funny enough, okay. because <laughs> there's a lot of similar, there's a lot of similar skills in waitering and, and being a showman. I mean, when you're waitering, it's all about you, the service and everything like that. And being a showman or an, an artist is also about, you know, those, those similar skills. I mean, it's obviously, you know, if we, dive deep into it it gets technical but the basic yeah. foreground you're selling you're selling yourself um and yeah. actually that's yeah. pretty much anything that you do i was i was listening to uh david uh, interview with david blaine the magician and he said he learned by you know going up to tables and asking if they want to see magic and he went into like the distance you stand from the table is important because like too close and you're you're coming into people's space too far and it's easy for them to say no you know, so like there's there's a ton of stuff you're learning in, in those kind of environments. Um, Trev, you wanted to say something there? Yeah, um, I was just curious, Lloyd. So, I mean, my timeline might be a little off, but if I heard correctly, so say about 10, 12 years ago, you were at this, you know, sort of fork in the road where you wanted to do more and you picked up an audio book. Now, I know audio books are very common in today's time but i think like you might have been a little bit ahead of the game 12 years ago um i would have if i was in your shoes 12 years ago i would have almost been like hey what should i go and study 
because you know there's a big you know drive on tertiary education especially say that time how did you stumble across audiobooks per se and not um, or, or did you it's, it's it's a very good question travis and and i'm while, while you're asking the question I'm, I'm actually trying to think exactly how i did it so to be honest with you, uh, there was a really good book. It, it, um, the power of one. It was just a good, not a business book or anything like that. So I was like, you know, it'd be nice while I'm exercising or jogging or driving. Cause I did a lot of driving back then. If I could just listen to something, cause reading, I, you know, um, I struggle with like, if you're driving or at night, if you read, you know, um, you know, so audio books was like, wow, let, let, let me get this audio book. Then when that audiobook came up, I saw all these other books that you could download too. Business books, um, biographies. I love I love autobiographies. Um, I really do. Um, and then all these biographies started popping up, like Richard Branson. Um, um, and yeah, the first book that 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 I came across after The Power of One was uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. I think that's a very popular book amongst people and especially back then it was it was quite popular so it popped up as something uh, i might want to listen to so that w- that was the first first book i a business book i i i downloaded and i i got stuck into i still remember driving um you know to free states to Joburg. i mean i'm listening to this book i still remember the roads that's that's how how i really got into it from 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 the first book which was just amazing Wow. And uh, it's, it's incredible that like just something like driving, actually how much you can enrich yourself if you, if you make use of that time. Uh, so, so yeah, that's um, now, I mean, what started to change for you? You, 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 you listened to this and you know, kind of what, what opened up for you in terms of what were you hearing? So, so what's, what was, not, what's nice about Robert's book to start out with. And if anybody, you know, wants to start with a business book or just to get an idea of the overall picture of business, he really puts it together nicely in his book. And then you start thinking, you know, how can I start applying this to my life and where can I go with it? So that's how it all started. And, um, you know, I still remember the lessons in that book and I've done hundreds of books since then. And I mean, every week I'm doing a book. That's, that's how hooked I am on it now. And, um, you know, his basic principles in there, it just gets you really good foundations. And then you'll see another book comes along the way and he'll suggest he learned something from that book. And then you go and download that, that, that guy's book or that woman's book. And then you just keep learning as you go. It's, it's, it's a great process. And then if you can apply it to everyday life in your life, um, it's a really, really fun journey. Lloyd, I'm curious. So now I'm imagining you as a 20 something, maybe early 30s musician, writing to gigs, you know, visiting people, listening to this stuff. Um, how did you, or what opened up for you, or what actionable steps did you start taking that took you from, you know, singing a gig or, you know, doing a gig to starting a business? How, what did that transition look like because of these books? So, so Travis, uh, it's actually quite a, quite a neat story. Um, I got hired to play a friend of mine's 21st birthday. So, um, not a friend of mine, somebody that came and watched us play shows and his father was a very wealthy man. He owned a very big chicken company in South Africa and he had several stores. I said, I built a relationship over, over some time, played the show for him and his younger son was a singer. So. I wrote the album with his son and I helped him, his son, you know, just learn the ropes of music and got him in the right studios and everything like that. And and we wrote the album together. So over that six months, month period, we became really good friends. And I asked the dad, Hey, do you mind if I open up a store with you? We go 50, 50. And I learned the business. He says, Lloyd, no problem. So I, I opened up my first chicken shop. Um, with with him and he showed me the ins and outs of how to run a chicken shop so that's how i started my first entrepreneurial little business sure that's brilliant and is that chicken uh, shop still going today or so so i expanded that business quite a lot over the over the past few years um and the business model has changed but that 
that chicken shop has now turned into quite a large wholesale chicken and meat company now. So it's grown a lot since then. That's brilliant. So it's almost as if listening to this material sort of laid the foundation in your mind to actually look for opportunities because I think that it's one part of the equation is to actually educate yourself. But if you're sitting on all of this knowledge and you don't do anything with it, then you sort of go nowhere. So it sounds like this really primed you for that eye for opportunity. Would you say that's, that's about right? Or? Tra Travis, you hit the nail on the head on the head. That's exactly how it happened. So it was like, okay, I'm starting to see opportunities. And then here, what I liked about that opportunity is one, the opportunity didn't come my way. I had to ask for it. A lot of people think the opportunities come their way. Yes, things come in front of you, but are you able to see that opportunity? And also don't be scared to ask. A lot of people are scared to say, hey, listen, do you, do you mind? Maybe we can do a partnership. And in doing that, it was a tried and tested business. So like what Robert Kiyosaki says in his first book, now that I'm thinking back on it, is he says, when you start your first business, don't start something, you know, yourself, buy a franchise. Why buy a franchise? Because it teaches you the ins and outs on how to run a business correctly. So in essence, I was buying into a franchise because there were seven other stores and there was a big business behind it. So I was learning from a franchise business model. Um, and then that's, that's how I, that's how I saw this opportunity. And yeah, the, the rest is history. <laughs> I think that's, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there because the first takeaway is don't be scared to ask, which is something that I've spoken to Alistair about before. And it's free to ask. The worst thing that can happen is you, you get told no. And the positive sides of it, you know, can be endless. And I think the second thing that you said there that I really liked was you don't necessarily have to do it yourself. So going out, getting a franchise, I mean, technically you are doing it yourself, but you've got that support system that can help you and teach you. And so I think that's really, um, that's really interesting. Al, did you want to jump in and uh, say? No, it's just, it just reminded me, I, I can't remember it word for word, but there's that saying that says, you know, opportunities are stumbled upon. They're not, they're not given to you, you know? So it's like, how would you find the perfect opportunity? And what it really sounds like is, you know, starting to to put yourself out there. Um, there's an element of risk in that. And I suppose rejection is the main thing that would stop us uh, asking, really. Um, you know, so maybe, yeah. I mean, Lloyd, how do you how do you see rejection? <laughs> is it is something yeah, you I factor think, in? I think, I, think, I think fear is fear is a big thing. Um, I mean, I grew up all over this, all over America. I went to 20 different schools. I went to like five different high schools. 20 so different schools. I, yeah, no, I was all over the place. I was, oh I mean, I literally, I lived all over America. I've lived all over South Africa. And, and, you know, it was just kind of, you know, to adapt, you got to just kind of be out there a bit. And, um, yeah, I think people are scared of no. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, and, and yeah, I think sometimes in, in certain situations, I'll, you know, back then I was like, you know, what happens if I ask and they say no? I mean, but, but you'll, you'll find what's funny about, about successful people that, that, you know, if you go and say, listen, can I please have advice? I mean, after Robert's book 10 years ago or 11 years ago, whatever the, the exact number is, um, I asked a lot of successful entrepreneurs, do you mind if I have an hour of your time? I'd love to pick your brain. How did you get here? And I did that with many, many people. And I bought, I said, what do you drink? Do you drink a bottle of wine? Do you drink whiskey? What do you drink? And I'd make sure I'd give them a bottle of whiskey just to say, thank you for your time. And, you know, I can phone any of them today and they'll give me advice. So good advice from the right people really helps. Um, and people are open to help, you know, I, and I, and I said to them, I said, do you know how many people ask you for advice? And they say, actually, nobody does. That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. You know, to me, it's like they've got the knowledge. They've learned a lot, you know, and they're willing to give you advice for free. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. And 
you just got to be open to people. It's all about people. You know, if you're, you know, entrepreneurship is selling. So that's you as a person is selling. So you got to be good at it. So, you know, just be yourself and, and don't be scared of no. If somebody's no, one out of 10 is no, it's, it's fine. You know, just carry on. You're going to get a lot of no's in business. Do you think the same is true for failure, Lloyd? Uh, so we, you know, we you obviously said you're going to get a lot of no's in business, but have you have you bumped your head uh, along the entrepreneurial route? Because all right, the, the I most, have a yeah. <laughs> Go, you have a no. I was I have a strong um, feeling that successful people are quite tenacious and they have probably more bumps on their head, you know, than successes. And uh, people tend to see the success and go like, wow, you're so lucky, but they don't often realize the route it took to get there. So I'm just kind of interested to peer into what's your thoughts on say um, failure and I business. Think, I think, I think it's a good question. I think you say bump on the head. I can show you the scars on my back. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's a better better analogy. Um, yeah, you you make you make mistakes. Um, you get hurt. You lose money. You you lose money. That's part of it. Uh, you know, I've had partnerships that went really bad. Um, got the scars on my back for that. But that's all lessons learned. Um, you know, and and if you can get through it and you're stronger, you learn just so much. Um, um, and the thing is, like school teaches you not to make not to make mistakes. It teaches you not to make mistakes, and it teaches you not to not to do projects together. So, you know, the world out there is all about making mistakes because you learn, and it's about working together. Um, you can't be successful by yourself. I mean, yes, you can own the business by yourself, but you need a whole team of people that are behind you. So, um, you know, that's that's the difference between what I've learned in school and university compared to the real world. So, I mean, that's why audiobooks really opened up my thinking and these autobiographies are just fantastic. Um, learning from other people's businesses. I mean, one of my favorite books is shoe dog by Phil Knight. I've listened to it about 20 times. Whenever I need inspiration, I go back and I listen to it again. Uh, the journey he went on, is insane and it's not unlike mine he just did it on a much bigger scale but it's it's he's he went through the same things he's got emotions you know he gets angry he gets sad you know he he's also human just like every single one of us and and the more people realize that that's how business is that's how life is it's not you know if you've got a problem you're not the only one that's gone through that problem everybody else goes through the exact same thing so if you can just you know, understand you're not alone and just keep working hard uh, forward, you know, the, the sky's the limit. I mean, in today's day and age, we have more opportunity than we've had ever. You know, everybody's uh, the recession, fuel price. Um, go read Phil Knight's book, 1960, same problem, 70, same problems, 80, same problems, 1990, same problems. They're all the same problems, just packaged a little bit differently. So you got to cut out the noise and focus on um, on what you need to do moving forward. Simple. Yeah. So, so anyone listening, uh, that book, uh, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, that's the founding story of Nike, the global sports brand. Um, what, what was interesting, having read that book, uh, is that uh, there's, there's so many unseen battles. There, there were, you know, there's all sorts of... Uh, you know, like sort of regu uh, regulatory um, aspects to consider in the back end. People could think about the story of something like Nike and, you know, it's all about this polished, stylish front end, uh, you know, of this brand and this. And really when you, you go and listen to the, 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 the hacks and the battles and everything uh, to sort of make things work and all of the, the work to get things, you know, across the finish line in so many cases, just absolutely eye-opening and fascinating. And I think a lot of people going into business, uh, you have an idea. You have an idea of something you want to do. Um, but to really count the cost and understand uh, I'm going to experience uh, resistance. I'm going to experience things not going right. And it's actually how I deal with that stuff. 
that's going to determine the success in the end. Uh, you know, and that kind of maturity, and I, I think that's something something you learn. Um, it's it's failing forward is something that uh, is a sort of well known concept. Um, but Lloyd, really interesting to hear about you know being speaking to people and approaching them and asking them and how under utilized that is you know everyone seems so busy trying to make it or succeed or study or do stuff and uh, there is just so much available in terms of actually speaking to people and then so much available out there and uh, listening to you and, and you know that optimism I listened recently to Ray Kurzweil he's a futurist and he is heavily involved in tech and if you look at the data and look at a lot of the uh, statistics, uh, there's a lot to be optimistic about, and there's a lot of opportunity. What would you say your mindset is? What would you say? I just want to kind of dive into your, your thinking a little bit, because this is fascinating. What have you kind of programmed in your mind when looking and hearing stuff to kind of find the opportunity versus the negatives and why it can't work. What, what's, what, you know, cause obviously you've read a lot and you've, I mean, if you could speak a bit about that, that'd be really interesting. Cause I think that's a really big difference for a lot of people. And for people who are maybe prone to being a bit negative, it could be really helpful to like, how do I wire my brain to kind of start seeing opportunity? All right. So business life is a game whether you like it or not. It's not anything more serious. It's it's a game. So it's how well you play that game. So it's let's let's look at business as a game. You start out learning chess, for example. You play a few moves, you try this, you make mistakes. Then you get better at the game. You get better at chess. You get better at playing. The same is with business. The more you do it, the more you get stuck in, the better you get at it. So when you see that, oh, I see that, that's a that's a good move. It's the same. I see that as a good business opportunity. Um, so the problem, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs get as well. And, a, and a, a, somebody that gave me advice a few years back, because you've seen all these opportunities, there's so many that you can start that start doing and you lose sight of what you're doing first. Like everyone says, well, Richard Branson's got how many different companies? I can be like him. But what did he do first? He struck gold in his first company. And then he expanded from there. So he dug deep into Virgin and he struck gold and then he expanded on top of that. He didn't expand on top without building the foundations deep down. So as an entrepreneur, you must, mustn't get caught up with too many different ideas. Make, make your idea work. And, and then once you strike gold there, then expand from there. Um, as one of, one of my other businesses, that's, that's the exact case. We struck, we struck uh, gold with, down deep and then we started expanding on the surface with with uh, branches out from that uh, business so um i'd suggest you know entrepreneurs must must definitely look at that aspect and not get too too involved with other too many other things and treat it like a game you know and the more you play it the better you'll get at it i mean successful business people multimillionaires, billionaires do you think it was luck yeah there was a lot of good timing and things like that but I mean look at a town or a city how many multi-millionaires are there in a city there's a lot you know so so um, you know you can be one of them you just got to keep playing the game and the more you play it the better you get I just wanted to ask Lloyd, in terms of people, uh, it's one thing you can't do everything yourself. You mentioned earlier about a good team. What's kind of your mindset on on the people you involve, uh, trusting people versus doing everything yourself? Because you can't scale anything if you're just going to be doing everything yourself. You see, you get a lot of, I, I've seen it with, with many different entrepreneurs. Um, some entrepreneurs micromanage where they're in, they're on those people's case every single day. Um, I give people freedom. Um, I really do. And in Phil Knight's book, he, he kind of manages and, and ran his business the same way. Um, you've got your people in place that, that do the checks, but I don't micromanage. I look at the overall picture and then I see, okay, um, I know each person in my team 
um, you know, what they're lacking in, what they're not lacking in, but I don't have to see them every day. With technology, I know what they're doing because I get daily reports and things like that from my phone. Um, so I know what they're doing and what they're not doing um, and where they're lacking. So with technology, it's made running business so much easier and you can have your finger on the pulse and uh, be up to real real time speed on what's happening. Um, you know, even an, another important thing is uh, we moved over to iCloud accounting. So it's, it's Zero's accounting name. I'm not, I don't work for them or make any money off them. It's just, I can see in real time what the daily sales are and what the actual profit and losses are um, and the GPs and things like that. Before I'd have to, at the end of every month, wait for the auditor to give me the management accounts for that <laughs> month. And then I'd look at it. Oh. Now I can do it in real time. At the end of that day, I can see exactly where we're at. So if there's a problem, I can pick it up very quickly, which is yeah, so, so your, technology your, de your decision, your decision making time is just sped up. There's no lag. So you can steer a business far quicker. Um, yeah. Just, just something else. Uh, you know, th th there's a good mindset in in uh, this whole thing with with other people. And and what I've seen is where people kind of stray is they they forget that they're the one in charge, and ultimately they're the the owner, and ultimately there's no real bad employee or bad team member because you've selected them, right? You were ultimately the one who appointed and should have trained or how do you, how do you see that? Do you, do you kind of take full responsibility or do you think there's a certain amount of responsibility? Like it'd be interesting just to hear your view on how much you are accountable for what happens or, or what you, how you your, see your that. Your team is solely, entirely <laughs> falls down to you. So you don't get bad employees. You get a bad owner or you get a bad manager. So um, you, you, you show them what your principles are and your business model and, and you guide them through it and you teach them and you yeah. teach them. Um, I'm not saying, you know, especially, you know, when you get somebody new, they need to – you know, start understanding your culture as a business. Um, so no, if you've got a bad employee um, or somebody that's working and it's not on the right path, um, because I'll know if somebody's getting out of line pretty quickly. When I say out of line, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, let's say not delivering the right customer service. And, and you know, not everybody's perfect and going to run 100%. You know, we're all human. I don't do it, so I don't expect expect uh, the people working for me to be on the same level all the time. It's, it's just not possible. Some people have dips. I mean, I have some people that have a dip every month. Some people have every six months. So you, you understand, you understand who's working, working. I, I'd say working for me, working with me is a better way to say that. Um, yeah. And I don't call them employees. I don't, they're, they're not employees. It's their business as well as my, as my business. It feeds my family and it feeds their family. So it's actually a business that we have together. I think I think that makes people want to work with you, work for you, when you appreciate that they are human uh, as well. Uh, there is a certain level of, listen, I just, you know, if, if it's so absolutely cutthroat and that one time I'm not going to perform because of really it was just not possible, uh, just to have that bit of sort of compassion that really builds uh, trust and uh, loyalty, I think, in, in in the end of the day. Well, I think, you know, I mean, I really care about everybody that's part of our team. I really do. I mean, you know, everybody, you know, like I said, it's 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 just so important to make sure that whole team works together. Um, it's like an airplane. If if the, the wheels don't come down, you're in trouble. If the fuel system doesn't work, you're in trouble. So it's the same in a, in a business. If something's not working, you're in trouble. It can be a small thing, but it's going to end up becoming a big problem. So mm -hmm. if I see something, I sort it out immediately. I'm like, you know, somebody might have lost their mother or they might be fighting with somebody. Just, you know, have compassion and speak to them and say, listen, are you okay? Is everything fine there? I see. And then, mm -hmm. then they open mm -hmm. up to you. And, and it's like, I care, you know, and, and our, our, our team turnover, we don't have people leave us often 
you know, we have teams that have been with us for years. Why? Because, you know, um, we respect and care for one another. And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's the biggest, biggest thing, um, in, in our businesses is that respect, um, um, it could just goes a long way. It goes a long way in life and in anything. And today's day and age, you know, um, there's a lot of angry people out there with all the problems that are that are out there. Um, so that respect in house is so important in our company and our culture. Um, and we actually that's our number one thing that we have in our business. And and it filters through to the team and to the customer um, who uses our products and our brands. No, um, Lloyd, uh, I wanted to ask, I know in the beginning of the, of this episode, you mentioned that, you know, working, uh, gigs, you had to actually be at the gig, earn the money, you know, and you wanted to sort of like pivot a, a little bit away from that to where you could possibly be earning money without necessarily doing everything, um, yourself. Do you feel that where you're at now, you've, you've, gotten closer to that goal um because some business owners i've heard from that they are say working harder than ever you know versus when they were an employee or doing a some sort of solopreneurship or you know what does that kind of side of things look like for you i think i think you know in the foundation side of business there's always a lot of effort and and, and things put in place um i mean i spent hours and hours in my chicken shops learning the business, you know. Um, now I've got quite a few businesses and I've got more time than I've ever had. Um, you know, while we're sitting here, I've gotten two SMSs. Money's coming to the bank account. You know, I've got – because people are using the product, booking the product while I'm sitting here talking to you. And that's because of a lot of things to get to that point, but to technology, the right team, um and the right products and just learning over the years so um i've got i've got you know trucks on the road doing deliveries to restaurants all over all over as we speak you know um so things like that so i've actually got more time now than i've ever had um it's, and it's, it's, it's been quite special it's interesting because i think what you start working on becomes more rewarding in a way um, but there's another side, and I think there's, uh, you know, we are made, <laughs> we're wired to be doing stuff. Uh, we get, like, like this idea of, like, absolute automation, and I'm not going to do anything. I'll be absolutely, uh, you know, bored stuff. Like, I can stay on that uh, paradise beach for so long, but uh, flip, I need to be doing something. Um, so I think it's interesting just, you know, always kind of involved in pushing forward and at the same time being freed up from stuff that, you know, restricts you or, or it's, it's a really interesting and, and, and cool position yeah, to be in. It, like, like the way you said, you know, I feel bad. Like I'm going to, I'm honest. Um, you know, I feel bad. I've got so much time. So now what? So, so what do you do with that time? Okay. So here you get to a position where you start, let's call it start making money. So what do you do when you start making money? So Robert Kiyosaki says, okay, you start business, you start making that successful. So what happens when you start making money? So there's two things. You make money and then how do you keep that money? Making money is one thing, but keeping that money is another thing. I'm sure you know of many people and heard stories of people that made a fortune and then lost it again. And they made it back again, but I'm... You know, so what I'm trying to say is, what do you do when you make that money? So now you got to look, okay, where do I invest? Do I invest it back into more businesses? Do I invest it into shares? Do I buy gold? Do I buy silver? So that's a whole other thing, side of business as well, investing. And I'm doing a lot of research on where to invest, how to invest, um, you know, so so now that I've got a little bit more time, I'm using that time to study about where to invest and how to invest, um, which has been a very, very interesting journey. Um, I've been doing that uh, research for years now. And yeah, it's 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 I don't, I, that's a whole other conversation on its own. But so so yeah, it never but, it, stops. but it's you good never to. 
Yeah, but it's good to it's good you mentioned that aspect because uh, it's one thing you're building a business and then it starts generating money um, and then there's a whole nother discipline actually is in in being wide uh, sorry wise with that money how what you do with it because otherwise it's, you know it's water it just runs out uh, before you know it so to actually be be smart with your money is a whole nother thing so that's great advice there um there's one thing Tra trav unless there's something from your side there's a particular uh, new uh, product you're launching Lloyd I'd like to just uh, ask you about that in uh, so you've teamed up with uh, arguably or I'm not I'm not too clued but it seems like the best or one of the best uh, uh, golf cart uh, manufacturers builders in the country and uh, what are you up to what are we doing okay so um yeah, I, I moved houses uh, about six months ago, and um, there was this beautiful golf cart in the garage. And um, I said uh, to the owner at the time, I said to him, I said, uh, can I buy the golf cart? So he says, yeah, no problem. So I bought the golf cart from him, drove it around, and I thought, wow, this thing is amazing. And it's not its not your normal you know, American-made golf carts. It's actually a South African-made golf cart. I didn't know it at the time. Um, and I contacted the company about five months ago and, um, I said to him, listen, do you mind if I do a rebranding of, of the golf cart? Um, and then we launch it, um, you know, online, uh, behind one of our businesses. Um, and we have it specially made, you know, to our specs, um, your top of the range, uh, lithium battery sound system, the works. So we're launching that uh, end of the week, it looks like. So um, five months in the making and, um, yeah, something exciting that we're doing. Fantastic. So that's uh, that's Dragonfly Estate Cruiser. That's the you, So you, you've positioned this as an estate cruiser, something for like mobility inside a lifestyle estate versus just simply uh, limited to golf courses, yeah. although it'll be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, so so you know, there's so many estates popping up. People are moving to estates, so uh, the team uh, got together, had a few hour meeting, and decided let's call it an estate cruiser instead of calling it a golf cart. Um, because you know, limiting a golf cart, you think for golf, but with the states coming up, you know, why don't why don't we position this as an estate cruiser and target estates, people living in estates? So. Um, we're going to launch that nationwide soon. Um, I'm very excited to see how it does. But there's another thing in entrepreneurship: you don't know how it's going to do. Um, all you can do is put yeah. everything together that everything together that you can, package it, position it, good quality product. You know you're going to give great service, and let's see let's see how how people react to it. Uh, Travis, I sent you a link. It's uh, estate-cruiser.com. I don't know if you want to just bring that up. Um, so this is pretty exciting. It's in, in it's uh, powered and, and designed by Drake. Drake is the uh, manufacturing house behind this. Um, can you see my screen? There we go. Yeah, we got it. Yes, we can wow the, cool. <laughs> okay these do not look like your average golf carts yeah no, I, I i thought it was important we had, we had to see this because this is this is something else fantastic cool i don't i don't live in an estate but i want to move to an estate so i can own one of these bad boys <laughs> yeah that's the, that's the plan i think that's lloyd's plan he has a he has a property business as well so he can sort you out <laughs> cool thanks so much guys no that's brilliant thank you lloyd it's Stop been uh, absolutely uh, it's been a really cool chatting to you and uh, getting to understand a little bit of how you think and and, and what you've had to do and uh, all the best with everything you're doing. And uh, it'll be great to touch base in, in some time again and see, see what's been happening and maybe dive into some of the actual businesses. Um, so thanks so much.
No, appreciate your time, Travis and Alistair. Um, yeah, it's a great, great podcast. Enjoyed being here. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Be sure to subscribe to the Boom Studio podcast on the platform of your choice or check out our website at theboom.studio for more details. Thanks for tuning in.